I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, a few more people are going to be drifting in through the waiting room, I think. Um, and uh, we have a, a, a special session today, uh, joined by uh, Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast, and Rob Moore and Lee Moore of the Chinese Literature Podcast. I'm going to do a very quick uh, introduction of them both, and then I'm going to um, we're going to we're going to have a conversation. We're going to talk a little bit about their uh, their podcasts. Um, I'm going to send in the chat. I'll send you guys out the links to their podcasts, and I hope. Um, I hope we have uh, a, a new a bunch of listeners here uh, to join the podcast, um, to join both of your respective podcasts, which I find uh, really, uh, really delightful. And I'm, I'm really excited to share them with, uh, with everybody today. Um, Laszlo Montgomery uh, is the creator and host of the China History Podcast, reaching thousands of listeners with every episode for over 10 years. He's the founder of Teacup Media, uh, and he has vast experience working in the China market for over 30 years. We're going to hear more from Laszlo in just a minute. Lee Moore is the co-host of the Chinese Literature Podcast and will complete his PhD in Chinese in less than a month. Uh, um, so uh, let's, all, let's all make sure we wish him luck uh, when we wrap up today. Uh, his research focuses on the making of identities within museums in China and Taiwan. And Lee also works as a journalist, having written for The Economist, SubChina, and That's Guangzhou. Rob Moore is the co-host also of the Chinese Literature Podcast, and in June of this year, completed his PhD in comparative literature, also at the University of Oregon. So great congratulations are, are in order for Rob, for Dr. Moore. Uh, he taught English in China for 10 years and completed a master's degree in Chinese literature at Nankai University in Tianjin. He specializes in translation practices in early modern China, uh, focusing on the years from 1895 uh, to 1912. Um, it's, uh, it's an absolute uh, delight for me to, to have you guys join us, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to our conversation together. Uh, so thanks to, uh, to everyone who's joining us this morning. I know it's a bit of a funny time. Uh, for everybody here, but it's an especially funny time for Rob, who's joining us from France. Uh, so thank you, Rob, for, for accommodating our Los Angeles uh, time here. Um, and uh, I want to uh, encourage everybody who's joining us. I want to thank our, our CSUSB folks for joining us, uh, Cal State San Bernardino. Um, and I also want to welcome anybody in who's joining from, uh, from, from outside. Uh, but please, um, Please, uh, oh, what time is it now? Uh, Nathaniel asks, is it uh, eight o'clock, nine o'clock? 7.30, we're nine 730. hours ahead. Okay, that's not too bad. No, it's uh, great. But uh, um, uh, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, thanks thanks to Rob for, for joining us. It is an odd hour for everybody, uh, but but I, I wanna thank, um, thank everyone for, for joining. And I also wanna encourage everybody to uh, go ahead and type in the uh, chat if you have any questions along the way, as, uh, as Nathaniel just led the way for us uh, with. Um, and uh, feel free to type any questions uh, a little bit later uh, as we sort of loosen up the program. If folks want to unmute uh, to ask questions, we can, we can do that as well, sort of on a case by case, uh, but just to, just to make sure there aren't any, uh, any, any mistakes, anybody you know, pocket dialing or pocket unmuting or anything like that, we'll, we'll have everybody muted until a, a little bit later in the program. Uh, and again, thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us. I wanna start uh, first off by asking uh, all of our, uh, our, our, our assembled uh, podcasters uh, a little bit about their journey to their particular ta uh, 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 podcasts. Um, how did you come to this podcast? How did you come to the, um, to, to, to the format of the podcast, but also the topic of the podcast? You're, your journey to uh, to where we are today, and I'll I'll start with Laszlo, and then then go on to to uh, Lee and, and Rob, if that's all right. You mean just to talk about how we got started on podcasting, or how we got started on our our China journey? Would would you prefer? Let's let's start a little bit about the China journey, and then how that led you to uh, led you to the the, the medium that's of podcasting. That's what led me. Yeah, for me. Um, 
well, I grew up in the north suburbs of Chicago. And, uh, you know, thanks to my parents who never missed uh, a, a Nat Geo special or TV documentary about anything that had to do anything uh, with world cultures. So I, you know, I grew up consciously aware of the other side of the world, thanks to my parents. Uh, may they rest in peace. Though, and though, um, well, I'm sure I could hardly stand to <laughs> uh, sit through it now, but, uh, you know, not even in my teens, uh, you know, there were a number of yellow face films shown on TV, such as, you know, The Good Earth, Into the Sixth Happiness, um, Flower Drum Song, all the Charlie Chan and uh, Mr. Moto movies, you know, and these shows, you know, filled me with this childhood wonder of uh, uh, China and just sort of grabbed hold of me in such a way that, well, it settled in and became part of my consciousness about China, you know, and then came Nixon's visit uh, that way well, yeah, I was 13 at the time. So I was aware of that and, you know, all the Life magazine uh, pictorials and the buzz that began to permeate U.S. society about all the speculative what ifs that, uh, you know, about uh, red China <laughs> and uh, the United States and that, you know, further fueled my interest. So, you know, these things, the, the, the yellow face that's so widely, I mean, looked, uh, looked down upon today, you know, and rightly so, you know, as this horrid racist side of Hollywood, you know, but that was really my early awareness about China and Nixon. So these were my early gateways. And then I went to the University of Illinois, 1977 to 81, and by then had read all of uh, James Clavell's books and other authors who wrote about, you know, novels about Asia. So I was already one of these you know, white guys who had grown up on a healthy diet of <laughs> Orientalism and <laughs> had acquired this, this love of Asian cultures, you know, and, and let me repeat, I mean, it's, it's looked down upon today and rightly disparaged, but, you know, despite all that, you know, everybody needs a gateway to serious study. And that's what worked for me. Uh, then January 1979, Deng Xiaoping came to America, and this led to U.S.-China normalization, and uh, that kickstarted everything we see today in, in 2021, for better or for worse. So that summer of 1979, I stayed down in uh, Champaign-Urbana, took advantage of the summer school course offering Mandarin, two semesters of Mandarin, and, you know, that's where I left all the Orientalism and fetishization of Asia behind and began to seriously study China. And then I graduated in 81. I moved out to the West Coast where I thought there'd be better opportunities uh, to get into a China career, which was my dream. And then in 1989, a few months after June 4th went down, I moved out to uh, Hong Kong and stayed there for nine years. And uh, yeah, I worked for two large manufacturers there making consumer products and played my, you know, over the period of 35 years, played my modest role in uh, keeping the shelves of Walmart, Costco, and Michaels, and Target, and Walgreens, and Dollar Tree fully stocked with Made in China merch. And I got to learn how that whole industry and the whole supply chain worked from end to end. And then, then after 20 years of working for this uh, firm in uh, Ningbo, uh, you know, as a manufacturing and group company, uh, I, I just left them after 20 years. And uh, now I look back on a, a almost 35 year career in US China trade. And yeah, I'm just filled with so many positive memories and experiences and made so many friends along the way and, you know, got to meet so many people who inspired me and educated me and mentored me <clears throat> in this world that I created for myself. So that's my story. Thanks, Laszlo. And, and before we hear from Lee and Rob, a little bit about, about specifically coming to the podcast and, and the, the genesis of that. Oh, okay. Well, podcasting, I don't know. Uh, 
that I, I would say, you know, it all began in 2004. That's when it, you know, uh, the pod father, Adam Curry, uh, Dave Weiner, these are the two guys who sort of started it all. And, um, you know, if you think awareness of podcasting today is small, back then it was, it was very, it was in its infancy. 2006, Steve Jobs made the big speech and, you know, showing with uh, a garage band, you know, how you could make your own podcasts. And um, it was around 2007 that uh, there were a few hit shows started happening in podcasting. And uh, I'm, I wasn't listening to podcasts yet, um, but I had heard of them. Podcasting, it was, it was like email back in 1995, 96. You know, I said, ah, you know, who needs email? Fax machine is here to stay. And that's how I felt about <laughs> podcasting. It was like, well, you know, uh, it's this new thing, but you know, you got radio and CDs. So, but for me, it was 2008, 2009 that I figured out what a podcast actually was and began actually listening to shows, all history shows, you know, because that's what I'm interested in. Uh, Dan Carlin, he started Hardcore History in 2006. Mike Duncan, History of Rome, the next year, 2007. Lars Brownworth launched his 12 Byzantine Emperors podcast in 2009. And those three had quite an impact on me. And uh, yeah, that's the holy trinity of uh, pod of history podcasts that seeded everything you could listen to today in the history podcasting space. So, um, but actually, it was a show called History According to Bob. That's what did it for me. Um, that's how I got into this racket. Yeah, Bob Packett. He was a retired high school and junior college. Uh, teacher who presented this show, uh, you know, early on. I'm not sure when he started. I'm guessing around the same time as uh, Dan, Mike, and Lars. And but if we could, if I could point to anybody who gave me that inspiration to to, to do this, it'd be Professor Bob, as he's affectionately known. He's this he's a normal guy based out in Kansas City who used his. You know, he was a folksy, you know, sometimes a little corny Midwestern style to essentially present world history, a whole range of topics. And nothing from Asia, though, or very little, I don't remember. But his wheelhouse was Western Civ, modern history, mostly with a lot of Greece, Rome, World War I, World War II. And though I enjoyed him very much and, you know, eagerly listened to everything he put out, I thought to myself, geez, man, I'm not a licensed educator or anything, but I could do this. So it was that time, 2008, 2009, that, uh, you know, there was nothing in the podcast sphere yet uh, that focused on China or Asia um, yet. So it was sometime early 2010 that I uh, started entertaining the notion that perhaps you know I could throw my hat in the ring and produce a show that essentially copied Bob's style of you know 15, 20 minute shows to present you know essentially uh, you know the greatest hits of Chinese history, but um, you know my uh, verbosity uh, got the best of me and these 15, 20 minute shows started turning into 25, 35, 45, an hour long. And, uh, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, there, and then around 2009, 2010, there were more shows popping up that uh, entered the history podcasting space. Um, they're all independents like me, Lee and Rob. And still there was nothing happening in China and Asia. So, well, yeah, you know, Melvin Bragg, BBC In Our Time, they occasionally had the, uh, the uh, Asian topic. But um, in June, 2010, I just sat down in my living room 
and recorded about uh, you know about ten shows. It was this big, uh, you know, all wood cavernous room. You know, and it sounded like an echo chamber. But uh, yeah, I just sat down and recorded these, uh, you know, these meat and potatoes topics of Chinese history, you know, Qin Shi Huang, the four great inventions, uh, Great Leap Forward, Kublai Khan, uh, Opium War, uh, Empress Wu Zetian. And I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. The, the, the audio was just terrible, but I managed to get the show up and running. And over the next, uh, uh, several years sort of, uh, you know, just uh, developed my own style of presenting the material and it began to evolve into what it is today, which is essentially presenting random topics covering ancient and modern Chinese history, as well as topics from Chinese American history and uh, other topics concerning the Chinese diaspora around the world, but mostly in Southeast Asia. And uh, 2017, I launched a couple other shows, a Chinese Sayings podcast, introducing stories and legends behind uh, certain Chinese idioms. And then I also started this very niche program. It was a little bit too niche for its own good. It was called the China Vintage Hour. And I read passages from antiquarian books that uh, were written by, you know, 19th century people who went to China and wrote about it. So I, I, that one went for about 10 episodes and then I had to pull the plug on that one. Um, and then I also have a show that's a spinoff of uh, this uh, History of Tea series that I did in 2014 called uh, Catchy Title, the Tea History Podcast. So yeah, China History Podcast, Tea History Podcast, Chinese Sayings Podcast, that's my little uh, uh, media empire. And uh, yeah, I retired in April and this is what I do now full time. And I just put the, um, the, the link in the chat for everybody. Uh, that's excellent, uh, Lazlo, and I really appreciate that. And I want to note that I, I was an early subscriber, an early follower. I, I uh, started my uh, current post at San Bernardino in 2011, just as you were getting started. And I had to teach ancient China, and I'm a modern China historian. And so I thought, what can I get um, in my ear while I'm jogging or you know commuting or something like that? And uh, and it was perfect. It was uh, you, you marched me through Han Wudi and I had to go in and talk about Han Wudi. So it was, you know, it, because I'm, I'm a modern historian, that's what I specialize in. It's wonderful to have this sort of way to get your feet wet on a topic. And I recommended it to my students. And um, uh, and and it is. Yeah, it's remarkable how the catalog has has grown. So I want to encourage everybody to take a look at that. Thank you, Lazlo. That was excellent. I, I want to. Um, Throw it over to Lee and and uh, and Rob, whoever wants to uh, go first. Um, a little bit more of a recent story, I think, from from Lee and Rob in terms of uh, a more recent podcast. But um, who wants to who wants to lead off and tell us a little bit about uh, your journey to the Chinese literature podcast? Go for Rob, it, Lee. Do you? Okay. Um, so uh, I uh, I started studying Chinese along with uh, Japanese and French in undergrad at the University of Georgia. Um, I, I actually, Chinese was the, the last language that I, I started on. I was doing Japanese and I just kind of thought, well, Chinese will be fairly easy. And I, I was surprised. I loved Chinese as a language much more than I did Japanese. Uh, it, it was just a lot more fun. I, I have trouble explaining it, but uh, I got a, a scholarship to, to China from the U.S. government in 2006. So I was in Kunming and Beijing for a year. Uh, and when I got back, I started listening to several podcasts, uh, one of them being the History of Rome podcast uh, and another being the Japan Considered podcast. And, and at the time, I, I, was, uh, I didn't realize this, but I, I actually uh, had a very mild case of undiagnosed dyslexia. And so I, I was really struck by how much more fun podcasting was, how much better uh, in terms of my consumption of the media uh, how much better that experience was uh, than than you know reading a book, which I still you know did quite a bit. Um, I kind of uh, I finished grad school. Or I got a master's in, at UGA. Finished that up. I went to BYU Brigham Young University uh, for a year uh, as a non-Mormon, which in and of itself was a cultural experience. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, then I went to, to Nanjing University uh, and uh, I did an internship at a, a museum building company in Kunming uh, in the southwestern corner of China. And uh, during that time, I actually started listening. A friend gave me a, a subscription to the Economist uh, uh, audio edition. So I, I, I was starting to consume much more media auditorily. I uh, got back in 2010 to the US didn't really know what I was doing. I, I tried some business stuff that didn't work out, but I was also consuming more podcasts. So Laszlo, I started listening to your podcast uh, around that time and the, the couple of years after 2010, uh, Seneca. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to start a podcast, but didn't, didn't think I could do it on my own. Um, 2013, I get a scholarship from the Taiwanese government, go over to Taiwan, get my Chinese up to a, a a fairly decent level, start grad school at the University of Oregon in 2014. Um, right before that, I actually won a grant from Outside Magazine. We got $10,000. Uh, a friend of mine and I hitchhiked the Silk Road. And that actually is where I got my, uh, the, one of the museums that I actually got interested in in Kashgar. Uh, that was kind of what started my dissertation project. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm consuming lots of uh, auditory media. I start this, uh, this graduate program, I'm, I'm doing Chinese, uh, and I meet this guy who weirdly has the same last name as mine. And uh, we, we kind of hit it off in that first quarter, at the end of the first quarter, I had dinner with uh, he and his wife, my wife and I were over at his, his apartment. And I was like, hey, you know, do you, do you maybe wanna start a podcast on Chinese literature? And, and he was game for it. And, and so we kind of modeled ourselves a little bit on China History Podcast and uh, Seneca. Uh, those were really the two sources that we drew off of because we knew we couldn't do it like Laszlo where we just kind of uh, did a straight talking format. It had to be a conversation if it was gonna be the two of us. So we, we tried to cover um, I'll, we tried to cover topics in a manner that's similar to how Laszlo does them, but in a more conversational way uh, that I think earlier Seneca did. I, I think they've become a little bit less conversational in the past past couple of years. I mean, they're still great. It's just they're so uh, they're they're almost this formal. Well, they are a formal media company, um, and and then we just kind of uh, grew it from there. We started airing. So we started. We recorded our first episode. I think the last week of 2014, the first week of, of 2015, but we, we really didn't feel comfortable airing those until uh, 2016. It was spring 2016 that we actually uh, started airing the podcast. And, and since then, we've just kind of grown it. And Rob, do you, what else do you? This is, this, in some ways, this isn't fair because my origin story is your origin story. So you just told my origin story. And so now I'm sort of stuck. But not like so, how you can. You know, it's like, let me tell you how I started the book. No, that doesn't work. Um, we do have very different trajectories. I, unlike the other two, I came at podcasting kind of as, I wasn't even seeking anything out. Like, like Jeremy, I was just like, I'm cooking, kind of like to be studying while I cook. Hmm, what's this? My exposure to China was a lot longer. I spent 10 years there. I taught English for seven years at a couple of different universities, one in Shandong province. That's where I started. Uh, I was in a, a small city of about a million people called Tai'an. If anyone knows the, the mountain Taishan, that was in, that was in our, our city. Um, it's a great experience. Very, very, very much off the beaten path in terms of cities. So all my students were farm kids and it was, it was, it was a really wonderful experience. Uh, but I knew I wanted to get a degree in comparative literature where I could do a couple of different languages at the same time, but I knew I wanted to do Chinese. So I went back in 2006 with the, with the goal of studying Chinese so that I could do grad work in Chinese. Uh, I did that from 2009 to 12. I got a Chinese government scholarship to Nankai University where I studied modern and contemporary Chinese literature. That one was, uh, <laughs> That one was hard. Uh, not that the PhD isn't hard, but my master's degree was entirely in Chinese. All the lectures in Chinese, papers in Chinese, master's thesis in Chinese. Thank God for Chinese tutors. Uh, the grammar on my master's thesis was not impressive at all. Thank God she saved me on that one. But I did it. 
it was it was a, it was an incredible experience. I, I, I still, in some some ways, even sometimes miss it. Started getting a PhD at the University of Oregon in 2013. Uh, by then, I'd married my wife, who is French. She was actually my French tutor for a while in China. If you really want to get good at a language, marry your tutor, and you are gold. <laughs> Do that. Um, now, my languages have flip-flopped. It's been a while since I've spoken a lot of Chinese. So my French is totally fluent, near native, and my Chinese is kind of second place, which is kind of embarrassing because I'm on a Chinese literature podcast, and I speak mostly French. But... That's a long story. Why am I in France? But the podcast part is, as Lee mentioned it, neither of us had grandiose plans. I think a little like Laszlo, it was sort of a, huh, what is this thing? Let's see what happens. Lee and I both wanted a way to be scholars without having to always be scholarly, without having to write papers, without having to present at conferences. Just let's just talk about the stuff we're reading, like you would with someone over a beer or coffee or some other kind of beverage. Let's just do that. And that was our that was our thing. If any of you are thinking about getting into it and you feel a little a little intimidated, Lee and I will send you our first couple of episodes because they are horrific. We recorded on a laptop mic in an echoey room and it sounds exactly like that. So we've gotten better over the years and uh, a little bit. <laughs> we have better equipment now. We're not better. The equipment is better. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun. It has been exactly what we hoped it would be, which is a chance to take our research and our interests and just, just go, just share them and see what happens. So it's been great. Thanks all. That was, that was a great introduction. And, and um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about your, your sort of your, your greatest hits, your favorite moments, um, some topics that you were able to cover um, that you felt you you really uh, you really enjoyed you're really looking forward to that to that topic and I know Laszlo interacts with his listener listeners and and asks them what they want to hear and um, and and goes goes with the flow in that way but also were there were there topics were there episodes that you were really excited to do you really really had a strong preference to cover a certain topic um, and then also if you'd like to talk about it the flip side. Uh, were there topics that were that were especially difficult or especially uh, frustrating for you to cover? Uh, and whoever wants to take that first, I'll, I'll just throw it out there. Well, I started last. I'm going to go first here because one just immediately sprang to mind because I filled out the Google Doc earlier, but I, I was suddenly reminded of one. Early on, uh, Lee and I were, were, were starting to get listeners, as in like in the hundreds. If you, if you do something like this and you see that that even a hundred people downloaded your podcast, you feel like you're Drake or something. You're just like, look at the numbers right now. <laughs> um, but there was, there's, a, there's a, a, a true titan of Chinese studies, Steve Durant, Stephen Durant, who if you do anything with classical history studies, on some level, Stephen Durant's gonna come into it. He used to run a couple of different things at the University of Oregon. He's still around. He's a very gracious man. And Lee and I were like, I wonder if he would be on the podcast. Could we ask? And he said, yeah, sure. And so Lee and I, in my very dingy office in the English building at the time, with a laptop mic and three cheap beers, were sitting down and interviewing this practically a legend in the field. It was a very surreal experience. He, he could not have been more gracious and engaging. And I think that was one of the first moments when we were like, wow, if he'll do it, maybe some other people will be on board. That was a very, it was very encouraging, but it was also uh, kind of surreal. Like, are we actually doing this? Podcasting, I think, has a lot of those moments. Like, is this actually happening? Are, are people taking us seriously? Is, 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 is that even wise? <laughs> Um, if I, I have a, a, a good example, um, early on, we, so this is an example, both of a topic that I really liked and a topic that I was really concerned about, but we, we have not gotten any comments on it. I think maybe we were just too small of a podcast. There's a, a, a collection of Hua Ben, the, uh, short stories from the, the Ming and the Qing, um, written by, uh, an author named Li Yu and Li Yu's kind of calling card is that 
he takes this genre of short stories, which is all a kind of about karmic retribution and things coming back on, on themselves and, and everything kind of fitting together in a nice, happy ending. Liu's calling card is that he kind of does all of that, but it's the, it's the happy ending that you don't expect. So there is a, a story called uh, Male Minchus's Mother Moves Three Times. And it's a, a story about a uh, 10 year old, 12 year old who uh, is uh, climbing a mountain in Fujian. And all of the, and, and this is not me saying this, this is coming from the story. All of the gay men of Fujian are climbing this mountain and, and I think making bets on who will bed this, this 10 year old or 12 year old. And uh, eventually one of them uh, uh, gets the young boy uh, and they have a, a happy sexual relationship. But as the young boy grows older, um, the, 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 the older male partner has to, uh, he, he starts getting sad and, and the young boy goes, why are you sad? And he goes, well, because you're, you're about to hit puberty and you're going to you know, become go from being a boy to a man. And so the, the young boy being a, 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 a you know, a, like a, a, a good kid in this context decides to, to castrate himself. Um, and uh, then word gets around amongst uh, the, the older man's uh, friends uh, in Fujian that he has castrated this young boy, which is something only the emperor is allowed to do. So they, they, they take the old man and the young man to the yamen and they strip the, the boy naked and it turns out he's been so filial to this, this father figure slash lover that he's actually grown a vagina. Um, it, it, again, it's the craziest story. And uh, so they end up killing the old man for violating this rule about having a, 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 a eunuch. Um, and uh, then, and this is the, the ending. Uh, the, the last wish of the, the old man is that that the young boy, now that he's become a, a woman, he takes on the role of a mother to his, his uh, children from a, a previous marriage. And so the young boy actually takes on the role of the mother and like Minchus's real mother, this young boy uh, mother moves three times just to make sure that, that the son gets a good education. So there's this, it, so it's, it's a happy ending. <laughs> But I, I mean, we were doing that show in 2017, Rob, I think. And, so, you know, just all of these issues. I, there are all these issues uh, with with gender and uh, the sort of discourse on on gender that we have today. Uh, and we were really concerned. And, and so that was one of my favorite episodes, because I think the story I think Liu is an amazing writer. I think the story is fantastic for how it kind of plays with the genre. But trying to navigate the the. Um, the disturbing content in today's day and age was was interesting, and we we ended up not we ended up thinking about not airing it if I remember correctly, Rob, and, and we went ahead with it, and either either we did it okay or you know we were just like three people listened to it, and so. And as a quick postscript to that, Lee recently threw it up back up on the podcast a month or two ago because we That's forgot right. to record something that week, and. Lee put it in as a stopgap, and we still didn't catch any flack. So maybe we're not quite big enough yet. We might need to air it again in a couple of years and see if we get canceled or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think dealing with this with this subject matter, and we'll talk about you know controversial content in terms of geopolitics as well. Um, I think it's it's a question of how you deal with it, and if you deal with it in a way that's that's mature. And and I'm looking forward to checking out that episode because I think. Um, there, there's always a way to deal with, with even the most, most contentious content in a way that's respectful and a way that's mature. So I have, I have little doubt knowing, knowing Lee and Rob that, that that's what you did. Um, uh, Lazlo, do you want to share a, a favorite or a, a dreaded uh, moment? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I got 285 so far that I've done. And I like talking about topics concerning um, Chinese American history, but you know more than half of my listeners uh, are outside the U.S. So you know, I'm not sure how much interest there is about this. But um, yeah, same with U.S. China history. I, I loved uh, the topic of Nixon's visit to China in 1972. 
Um, I really, uh, that was just such a great story. So filled with drama, but you know, the Nixon brand, it's still pretty toxic uh, to many. And I could tell by the download stats that those episodes uh, weren't, weren't my most uh, popular. I, I did that. I, I, I did that a seven part of to, to, to mark the 10 year anniversary of the show. Cause I, I guess uh, not everyone was dying to hear it, but I liked um, I liked the uh, series I did on Deng Xiaoping. That was an eight part series. Same thing with the uh, one I did on Zhou Enlai. Uh, he's someone I admire a great deal. I liked the history of Hong Kong, uh, 10 part series uh, and the history of tea. Uh, Cathay Pacific Airways still features those shows in their in-flight entertainment uh, system. Uh, I, another favorites, I did a two episode, uh, uh, two episodes on Morris Two Gun Cohen. That's always a sentimental favorite of mine. Uh, I can't believe no one's made a movie of that guy's life, but that, that was a, that was a, a favorite of mine. The history of the Jewish refugees in China, also a favorite. That one turned out quite nice. Uh, I did a three-parter on, uh, uh, Sir Edmund Backhouse, who's uh, always good for a hoot. <laughs> so I'm very fond of that one. And I did one, uh, an, a, a nine part series on the history of Chinese philosophy. Mm. And I, I went back and re-listened. I don't listen to my old shows too much, but I, I listened to that one or a few of them. And Wow, in all modesty, I have to, I couldn't believe I did it. It was like listening to someone else. It was so enjoyable and informative. But I have many favorites. I like them all. But those, uh, those were particularly uh, enjoyable for me. Laszlo, can I say, I think my two favorite series are the Hong Kong series and the, the history of Xinjiang. Yeah, yeah, yeah Xinjiang. That's my long, that's my epic. That, that was the longest one I ever did, 12, uh, 12 parts. It's awesome. I, mine is the history of tea, anything to do with tea. I'm a tea nerd. So I, that, was, that was the first one I listened to. And I was like, oh, now I see why people listen to this podcast. <laughs> Time to get a refill it. there. Water, sparkling water oh. now. It's pretty late enough, I need to hydrate. <laughs> I want to... Um, Sort of, and and there there's some questions. I want to make sure that we get a couple links, uh, both to the story. Did you say the author was Lee Yu? Lee, uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So we'll just track that down the story, and of course, yeah. it's a reference to the um, Menchus's mother actually did move three times, right? Because they were near a butcher's, they they were near a graveyard, and then they were near somewhere else, and and he had to move again. I can't remember. Only, but, she only stopped moving when he got to, to a house near a school, right? Near the school. That's right. That's yeah. right. So she had to move and and uh, and get to a get to a healthy healthy place. And this sounds like a uh, obviously a, um, a, a a radical spin on that. And so I think <laughs> let's let's just get the um, for for Yawen. Let's get the the. I'll, I'll see if I can track that down. Lee Yu is is um, uh, sounds like an important author uh, as well. So. I, I want to sort of just spin a little bit off of this topic um, to to the, the the geopolitical context, whether it factors in um, or not. And you know, if it doesn't, that's still that's still relevant. You know, do you just say you know geopolitics be damned? I'm gonna I'm gonna cover this topic, um, or do you think about uh, Lazo talked a little bit about his audience just now. Um, where his audience is listening from, and I'm, I'm sure you guys have some sense of that, where, where some of your listeners are, where the, the bulk of your listeners are. Um, how, do you, how do you consider that as, um, as, a, as a platform, uh, putting your information out there, choosing topics, thinking about what to cover? Um, is it different, for example, from what you, what you might cover in, um, uh, in, in a class that you were teaching? Or in a um, around a table with with uh, with with business associates, are there things that you choose to include, choose to exclude? Um, how much? Um, and 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 then maybe you know, if, if you're speaking of you know, flack or speaking of hearing back on on certain things um, that might be very popular or might might be hitting a nerve or something like that. Um, just a little bit of a sense of your your experience so far with that dynamic and the calculus that goes into choosing topics. 
choosing content and, uh, and that kind of thing. Whoever wants to jump on that question. Well, I mean, in presenting anything, I, I use my built-in spidey sense, you know, to assess whether or not addressing a certain topic is going to cause any alarm bells to go off. Um, for example, right now, uh, I'm working on a new episode, uh, probably come in December, that explores the life of Dai Li, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's head of uh, the secret police, uh, among other things. And a big part of Dai Li's uh, life or his story includes his involvement, uh, his role in Seiko uh, during World War II, the Sino-American Cooperative Organization. And, you know, they did some great stuff, but they were involved and in, also involved in some pretty terrible stuff. So while I'm working on this topic, I'm already trying to, you know, how am I going to frame this and I have to predict some of uh, you know, what are some of the, you know, ultra nationalist right wingers, uh, you know, how are they going to take this? And, you know, am I going to leave myself vulnerable to, uh, you know, Americans who might attack me for, uh, you know, daring to mention anything about the country, you know, in such a negative light. Uh, so while I'm doing research, uh, I'm already thinking about how to, how to frame the presentation in such a way that no one tries to assassinate me or, or burn down my house or, or worst of all, cancel me on uh, social media. Uh, an example, uh, I did a four part series uh, years ago on John Service. You, you remember that? I don't know if you, you know who John Service was, you know, he's, yeah. he's uh, you know, so Americans who, you know, identify with the right wing of the spectrum, you know, hate this guy as a traitor of the worst sort. And they, they, they sort of blame him and others like him who were um, part of the so-called China hands uh, of the 1940s who, you know, pointed to the obvious defects of the uh, Chiang Kai-shek regime and, you know, who called for more dialogue with Mao and the communists. And uh, now, you know, that may have been a bad idea. Uh, you know, we don't know what might have come out of recognizing uh, those guys early on. Of course, we can draw conclusions today and say, you know, well, you know, trusting the CCP, you know, would have been a massive mistake, but, um, you know, history also show that backing John wasn't such a good idea uh, either. But um, yeah, I always have to think of those things and just, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to, to, to change anyone's mind. I, I just take the history and present it as best I can. And, um, you know, some, you can't please all the people all the time. So, uh, um, it, you, you, usually there, there's, there's, there's very little, uh, if any, controversy. I, I walk that tightrope pretty well. And Lee and Rob, you guys, you talked a little bit, Lee, about about obviously a controversial uh, topic. Uh, but any any uh, thoughts about this? I'd be curious. Yeah, so, Lee, I'm going to give a quick answer, and then Lee, you jump in. But one of the things I find fascinating about literature, in particular, is it kind of allows you to get at geopolitical issues through the back door, because literature is one of those fields where people go, oh, it's just stories and poems, you know, whatever. If you've read any Chinese history, you know it's not just whatever. It's crucial to all Chinese discourse throughout history. But that tends to not be the case or not as much the case in, in at least the United States. So there's a lot of topics you can get at that would be controversial if you were doing sociology or history. But literature, people don't tend to notice as much, perhaps just because it's a story. But also, Lee and I just tend to go with whatever interests us. And by and large, literature that is overtly political or slamming a regime or something tends to be very boring and dry, no matter where it's written. And we tend to not do those, not because they're going to get us in trouble, but just because why, why, why talk about it, really? There's not much there to dig into. So we, we tend to go for stuff we can really analyze and discuss. Lee, would you, would you agree or not, not so much? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, we haven't really had any issues in terms of the geopolitics. And I think, Laszlo, your podcast kind of lends itself much more to those kinds of issues than, than ours does. Rob, you're right. We can kind of duck it, but we can't 
duck the sort of uh, domestic political scene so well. And, and as this, the Liu story demonstrates, you know, we, we have to kind of think about how we're framing that. I don't think, Rob, I, don't, I can't think of any example where we've been like, you know, this is too hot of a topic, either geopolitically or domestically to touch. We do have, um, I, I should mention, uh, so Rob, I don't even know if you know this, but, but my wife actually uh, listens to every episode before we put them on. She's done this for about the past year and yeah. uh, she, she censors it. Um, so when, when we had, when we have a comment uh, that, that could be misconstrued or something, she's our kind of antenna that says, Ooh, wait a second. Um, we, uh, a couple of maybe last week, Rob, was it? We, uh, I, I made a, a, a joke about uh, Mormons. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I'm a non-Mormon, but I went to, to BYU and uh, I think I, uh, I was uh, mentioning a professor at BYU and Rob kind of just said, he kind of rolled his eyes and said, you know, oh, you know, not that great of a school. And I said, please, Rob, don't, don't insult BYU or me and my wives will get angry. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, like, I, uh, you know, I, I did, we decided to leave it in there because we, we do want to have that kind of uh, in funny engagement. And Rob, I think, if, if I rec remember correctly, you said, if, you know, we can't insult or kind of make a make a joke about uh, this group of people who has this, who is fairly powerful, right? Like, I think you, you expressed it in more um, sort of domestic political the way, terms, the, way I, but... the way I put it was, if cishet white males can't make fun of cishet white males, then we're, game's pretty much up, I think. But also because in the same comment, shortly after the comment, you said, and I, and I love Mormons, I loved the whole yeah. experience. So you qualified it. You didn't just make the joke and move on, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just to and, steer and, back real quick, you know, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. So far, no one has, has commented on that. So, right. <laughs> yes, it was. The Mormon Church dealt with the Book of Mormon, the musical. I think they can, our podcast is probably going to go below the radar. But to, to steer <laughs> back real quick, you know, geopolitically, um, I think we tend to not, we don't, seek, we don't seek out trouble, but we don't avoid it. It just tends to have not found us very much yet. Thanks. That was a really good and, and a thoughtful answer, because I think, I, as with the Mensch's story, you know, the way that you deal with it, as long as nobody's out there, you know, taking sound bites out of context, uh, you know, saying we're going to we're going to get rid of all the coal jobs or, you know, whatever it is, you so, sort of sort of taking taking something that you said completely out of context and then and then sort of spinning it. I think you're if, if you're given that that longer opportunity to to spin out an idea and to surround it and to 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 sort of sit with these longer conversations it is a new medium but it also is a medium in which you have the opportunity to explain yourself and and i like that as well um and and the, the next question is a little bit related to this um about the, the the sort of popular medium because it because an offhand comment can when you have hundreds or thousands of people um listening to your platform in the same way that a responsibility of a teacher uh, or, or an instructor um, has what may seem like an offhand comment or just sort of a tap can, can, can be like a howitzer in, in somebody's perspective, perspective, right? So somebody is in a disembodied environment, somebody's hearing what you're saying, not simply as an intimate chat, but as a platform, right? So you become your platform to some extent. And there's something different from uh, from, from, from an individual, right? You're, you're putting material out on a platform. Um, and so I think the three of you all really take that very seriously. Um, and so it's, it's for those who don't take it seriously, you know, that take, take seriously the distinction between the individual and the platform that, that I think we get into really dangerous territory. Um, but because I think the three of you are so sensitive to that, we, 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 we don't really have an issue, even when you're dealing with what is you know potentially the, the most kind of controversial and volatile sort of subject matter. So I, I think that's important. And again, the sort of long conversations of, of, a, of a podcast and the very personal opportunity to, to really express yourself on your own terms and put the material out there is, is excellent. Uh, Rob. I just want to throw in there real quick because it was something you just said reminded me. I also think you can, you can tell the podcasts 
there are the podcasters for whom the form is as important as the content. When a, when a story, when a poem is just a platform for expressing your opinion on, say, gender, geopolitics, something like that, and the poem gets left in the dust, that's when people tend to get into trouble. When I listen to Laszlo's podcast, I hear someone who loves history, not just the, the topic, but the way it's written, the way it's researched, the way it's referenced. Uh, when Lee and I discuss literature, like that male Minch's story, we spend most of the podcast talking about the form of the Huaban, the short story, and how Li Yu kind of tweaks. What's brilliant about the story is how he tweaks all of your expectations and the expectations of readers. And so that's not a dodge. It's it's just crucial to remember you're you're here to present this form, not just what it's talking about. And if you can keep those two together, I think that's when you really end up getting something more valuable. I this is this is right into the next question of the of the the medium of the podcast um, as a, as a popular medium, um, which the three of you are all in in many of your episodes, most of your episodes, bringing what is otherwise academic content uh, and subject matter um, that's often sort of narrowly pigeonholed uh, within within the world within the sort of ivory tower academe world uh, to a much broader uh, much broader much more general audience. If you could talk a little bit about the process, the sort of matrix of how that how that happens in your work, and and Lee and Rob, you guys are very very close to this, um, as uh, as as uh, Rob hot off the press uh, 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 PhD certificate, and and Lee, yours is in the works, um, but also Laszlo, I, I know this is something that you and I have talked about. Uh, so so please, who wants to uh, jump on that uh, that question? The, the process of how a show is created? Yeah, and, and translating a lot of the academic texts that you, you read for, the, you know, uh, for, 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 for a general audience who otherwise maybe doesn't want to sit through a monograph from uh, you know, uh, a Duke mm -hmm. University Press or something like that. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's, really, my, uh, that's really my core listener are, I guess you could call them a China curious type of people who are interested in China, but you know, they don't want to suffer through uh, a whole uh, monograph or you know, any book, uh, you know, a history book. It's just re really either just not for them or it's too intimidating. So this medium of podcasting, um, it's, it's not an audio book. It's more of a present, you know, I don't, presume, I think it would be terribly presumptuous of me, you know, a retired businessman to say, you know, that I teach. I'm, I, I like the word edutain, you know, edutainment. It's education, but, eh, you know, you don't take yourself too seriously. So I, um, I'll take subjects that I think are easy to, uh, you know, not too esoteric and uh, uh, something that I, that I have a sense that mm, you know this might be interesting, and a lot of it the topics that are uh, uh, recommended. You know, PI gave you all the time. The listeners are saying, "Hey, you know, do this, do that." So you know, they're sort of like uh, you know, I, I uh, fortunately my 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 son uh, you know works in a college library, so I can, I can get access to uh, all these academic papers, you know, without having to pay the uh, crazy uh, fee. Uh, the fees that are involved in that. So I use a lot of those and sort of, and, and of books, of course, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet as well, and just sort of sift through it and find a way to tell the story and remain as true as possible to the facts. And don't try and I don't try and be what I what what I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm not like you guys are. You know, uh, scholars. I'm, uh, I I I try to just sort of tell it in such a way that's entertaining and serious, serious yet entertaining as as possible. And you know, some of these topics are are you know involve these terrible tragedies and involve you know, loss of life and. 
you know, uh, you know, just the, the last one I did on the uh, L.A. Chinatown massacre uh, this past uh, Saturday was the 150th anniversary uh, of that uh, event. So I just try and, uh, and, and do that and present it in a, in, in a kind of a style, you know, I, I was involved in had been in sales and marketing and China business for my whole career, for the whole arc of my career. It's selling uh, made in China merchandise and being a front man for, for these uh, manufacturers in China. And so- Now you're doing I'm a just, different- Yeah, <laughs> now it's sales and, and marketing. I'm doing it with Chinese history. So- <laughs> Uh, it, it, it works. I just sort of developed my old my own style to present it. You know, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Some people don't don't care for it, but um, um, it, it 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 works. And I think uh, you know a lot of the feedback that I've gotten over the years isn't you know is is people to say you know uh, it's 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 not what you're saying it's how you say it that's what hooks me and that's why i've been such a long time fan so uh you know that's that's how i um present it it took yeah, i've been doing it for more than 11 about 11 and a half years now of podcasting and you know it took it evolved if you listen to the first episode and you listen to the last one you know, it's like two different shows, but um, I just, yeah, you know, I've just developed my style and, and, and that's, that, that seems to work. And uh, uh, that's how I present these topics. For, for us, Rob, and tell me if you agree. I mean, we never really intended, like there was no point where we like wrote down a draft of what we wanted to do but what you're hearing is essentially a seminar room uh that's been i mean we bring beer in uh so that i think makes us more excess i mean it makes us less stuffy uh and therefore more accessible but uh that's kind of how that that's our formula seminar room plus beer equals a chinese literature podcast we tackle the same issues that we would in a seminar room um, we're not holding back uh, any of the discussion. We we kind of get rid of some of the jargon, but that that's Rob. Is that right? Am I? It's about right. I was thinking a second ago. You know, if you ever are in a in a grad school situation, there's a pretty huge gulf of difference between the way people sound in a seminar room and the way they sound when they're talking about the same thing outside the seminar room. Like if you're in a seminar, everyone else sounds smart in the seminar. They we're throwing the right terms around. You got to impress the professor. As soon as everyone leaves, you end up talking about what you really think about, and, and you're just kind of throwing that back and forth. And that's that tends to be the good stuff. And I, as you know, Lee and I both absolutely love teaching. And I would say, at least the same way, I don't think any topic is beyond anybody. It just matters how you present it. And if you can present it the way you hear it when no one's trying to sound smart in a seminar room, yeah, you can you can pretty much just do whatever. Which actually brings a, a, a point. So uh, Lucas Rodriguez, thanks for that great question you asked. Yeah. Is edutainment the future of education? I uh, I, I would actually uh, I think it I think you're right. It is, but also it should have been the past, right? Like to a certain degree, the reason that edutainment is a new thing is just because teachers have been able to be super boring. And what we're trying to do with the podcast is a, a little bit reimagine how we would want to be educators. You know, we want to have accessibility, um, but that's something that educators should have, right? I mean, Jeremy, you're 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 a professor. You know, how do you deal with that that question? Yeah, it's I, I, it, it gets a little bit to I mean to podcasting as a kind of teaching platform as a kind of accessible teaching platform. And, and um, I think Lucas is right that, that you do have to keep everybody's attention. Um, and and uh, Rob and Lee, you guys I'm sure have been doing a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, TA work and, and probably started to take on your, your own classrooms. Um, and, and Laszlo, you're in your own classroom you know, with, this, with this China History Podcast. 
So you have to you have to think about maintaining your your audience, keeping everybody awake. Zoom is a little bit tricky because uh, unlike Nathaniel and a few a few others, you got your got your cameras off, so you could just be sort of zoning out until you hear the word words. It's going to be on the midterm, then everybody sort of <laughs> snaps to attention. Um, but but I think yeah, be, being relatable. I think the distinction between research and teaching is is part of what's happening in the bridging of the podcast, um, even to a to a greater extent where you think, um, well, this isn't this isn't an undergrad Chinese history or Chinese literature class. I've got to I've got to make this make this relevant to an even larger audience. But taking out that jargon, I think, is important. And sometimes that means, I think, which you guys do really well, taking the extra five minutes to unpack an idea that somebody will brush over and just assume a kind of understanding of as a sort of code, um, a sort of in, uh, in group code of talking about biopower or something like that. Say, so, okay, let's, let's wind that back and, and let's talk a little bit about what, what, what we mean by the subaltern or biopower, whatever it is. And, and instead say, okay, there's this whole entire literature that you you should be aware of and let's slow down because it's important and it's interesting to talk about it's not interesting if you use sort of coded language everybody feels that they're being excluded um unless they've they've, they've got the right pedigree so i th i think that this is this is to the last question um and we'll wrap up at about quarter of the hour uh, but but about being a reliable source of good information in the digital medium uh, being a sturdy source of good information, which I think the three of you absolutely are, um, about China in a in a media landscape that we know now, if you're following the 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 the, the sinking ship of social media and and Facebook, uh, and I hope I hope all my students heed my warning to get off the sinking ship uh, that is uh, Facebook or whatever else. Um, yeah, move to TikTok. And, <laughs> and and it's I mean it, it find it, there there are fast and fun forms of media that can also be reliable and I think you guys are a testament to that. Um, but in terms of being a reliable source of information, the the three of us had talked a little, four of us had talked a little bit, exchanged some ideas about that. So if we could um, uh, shift into that uh, that responsibility and and the considerations that go into that uh, that calculus as well. I, so uh, one of the things that when we were having this discussion, I suggested is that, uh, you know, podcasting allows for the sort of breaking down of these gatekeepers. You don't have the sort of 1950s U.S. media environment where only certain people uh, of a certain class, race, gender are, are kind of at the, the gates allowing information in and out. Um, and, and I think that's a positive, but I think we're still the, the sort of thing that we're seeing with misinformation is the, the flip side of that. And how do you figure, how do you navigate that in this contemporary, contemporary media landscape? Uh, I, I know this sounds weird, but yeah, I think that one of the ways you, you do that is you go back to gatekeepers. Uh, so, you know, anybody can start a podcast, but not everybody can get uh, scholars on their podcast. So, you know, we, we have done interviews with, with scholars and, and we feel that not only is that a fun way to kind of bridge the gap between uh, academia and, and real life, but it's also a way to, to demonstrate our street cred that if, if scholars like Steve Duran, um, we, we just recorded an episode yesterday with uh, Professor Carolyn Brown, who is at the Library of Congress, um, if, if scholars of, of that caliber are coming on our show, then I, I, I feel like I could trust that show. Um, and, and that's what I hope our listeners uh, feel. And it's interesting because uh, we'd had an interesting question here a second ago about uh, there still being a need for formal education and, and not just, you know, edutainment and whatever. But what's interesting is... Um, you know, in the last couple of years, I've, I've read an inordinate amount of articles talking about the death of the humanities. There's no funding for the humanities, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, Lee, I think you and I both at, at, at various points have caught a lot of resistance from scholars when you talk about really trying to engage a general audience, because that's not considered, you know, serious research. Um, 
But what's fascinating is I think the vast majority of topics that, you know, I've even studied in seminars in grad school, when you present them differently, just about everybody's interested, you know, so at some point people go, oh, I've never read that. That sounds really interesting, right? Because you're just not using the same language. Um, what's great about podcasting is it's kind of in between. It's not just, it's not a TikTok or, or Facebook post, but it's also not a monograph. It's somewhere in the middle. You can't go anywhere unless you have some credibility, unless you're clearly presenting something with some value, um, especially with Chinese literature, or something with history or anything else. So you are able to kind of bridge these two worlds. And I, I, I can't stress enough just how important it is to have, I think I put it in a, in a shared Google Doc, we have, have better PR. Uh, science has incredible PR, right? Uh, there's just everything you could possibly want to know about experimental physics. And I love reading about this, too. I'm a nerd. But what is there about literature, philosophy? Like nothing. And it's not because there's nothing good there. There's amazing stuff there. You know, it just somebody's got to kind of step out and go, hey, by the way, there's some great stuff here. Come take a look, you know. And uh, Lazo, I think you're also, this is always front of mind for you. And we've talked about it as well, that, that sort of translation and, and, and being a front man. Because I think to your point, Rob, that there, there is, you know, in terms of, of literature, film and fiction and that kind of thing, there is, there is a lot of really problematic material out there sure. um, in, in terms of a sort of hasty understanding of it. And whereas there's junk science and people know it's junk science, but, but um, you know, sort of, unserious uh, uh, history just abounds, right? It's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's kind of what our friends 50 miles to the West here in Southern California do as their stock and trade, you know, bad history. Uh, and so we, we have to kind of catch that and deal with it all. Uh, and, and, and I think same goes for, for, for literature. So being a kind of, um, a, a, a kind of popular and accessible platform that isn't, uh, that isn't kind of pandering to the to the fairy tale nonsense that we see in terms of the kind of history, like like you say, Laszlo, you're you're dealing with enormously serious content, and 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 Lee and Rob as well, um, and to to sort of tie it up with a bow would be an enormous disservice to the to the to the subject matter. And so, you want to reach that audience, but you also don't necessarily want to. Um, uh, uh, you know, tell them, a, you know, sort of Hua Mulan uh, kind of a kind of a version of it that's uh, that's, that's problematic. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, as you could see, I'm not even Chinese. So, you know, presenting. No. The, yeah, I'm not. Um, so, you know, I got to be careful. I mean, I I don't want to offend and, you know, I've been, as I said, I've been doing this for 11 and a half years and never once has anyone anywhere in the world come to me and said, hey, you know, why did you say that? Or, or I didn't appreciate that remark or, you know, why a little less snark in your presentation or anything. Um, yeah, uh, I... I feel I have responsibility and I'm, and I, and I should be careful and I should, you know, know, uh, you know, what's appropriate and what isn't. And, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm happy, uh, that I've, you know, I've come this far and, uh, you know, no one's ever called me out, you know, I mean, but, you know, in terms of right wing or left wing, uh, um, feelings, you know, people have said, oh, you know, they've called me out for that, but never for, you know, something that I, that I, that a way I presented something and they said, you know, that wasn't uh, right or how dare you. Um, yeah, I think just with you guys with literature and me with history, I think people could see these guys really dig this subject. So, you know, you could see the enthusiasm and and uh, you know the love of the subject matter. So I want to open it to to comments one more time because we've had some great comments, um, and then I want to wrap up in about three or four minutes and let our guests 
go uh, and, and thank you, but, but give you a chance for any closing remarks. I think on that point, Laszlo, and, um, and this applies to Lee and Rob as well, there is, there, there is such expertise that you, that you bring to your material, um, yes, from, from the perspective of, um, of a Western, of a foreign uh, observer. Uh, but with with a profound level of sensitivity, and you joke about about canceling and that kind of thing, uh, and and the awareness that you bring to it, uh, but also, it's, you know, in really uh, um, in a really simple way, the pages read, the material, the the old media consumed on behalf of your dear listeners, is evident in the excellent work that you do. It comes through. And so the kind of uh, um, uh, the, the kind of slow media uh, um, ambassadors uh, that you guys are in a fast media environment is a, is really encouraging uh, and really exciting that that you um, that that you're able to process this material to bring such a such a profound level of expertise and and knowledge and understanding and present it in uh, in an accessible way is exciting uh, to me as an educator because I can share this work and I thank you for, for joining us to share it with the, with the Cal State San Bernardino community. And I know we have some folks uh, logging in from, from around the country and around the world, um, but, but it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, 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 to hear from you guys. But every time I do, I know, uh, I know that I'm hearing from really reliable sources in a fast media scape. Uh, if, if a fast media environment. So, so I, that, that's really exciting. Um, so I, I, I just want to add my own uh, appreciation to, uh, to, to all that you, you do. Um, there's a little note, uh, uh, one final note from, from Arsel. Um, I'd love to hear more about Taiwan, um, why they don't declare independence. So we didn't, we didn't do anything controversial today. No controversy. Until that. Uh, <laughs> we got two minutes to talk about. I'm sorry, my connection's breaking up. I don't, huh? I don't what? Uh... You know, Ty, the history of Taiwan is one of the most requested topics that I get all the time. And I keep meaning to do it just like I did for the history of Hong Kong. You know, people think, oh, the history of Taiwan it began in 1949. But uh, you know, I, I, I really wanted to cover that. I've actually wanted to go to Taiwan. I have so many listeners there that have said, oh, you know, anytime you do history of Taiwan, you know, I'm your guy and let me show you this and I can introduce you. So yeah, uh, Taiwan's uh, history of Taiwan is a, is a topic uh, that I'm going to get to uh, maybe after the, it's, it's uh, safe to come out of our uh, clamshells or what have you. But yeah. Um, yeah, um, the independence thing, um, you know, there's a lot of history that goes before that, that you have to know first before you, you know, jump on that bandwagon. And uh, um, so I, I hope to get to that one day. Uh, that's a good, that's a good answer, Laszlo, that, that, that prevents, precludes us from spending another seven hours here in conversation. <laughs> it's a great I'm question. Telling you. And, and there's a lot to it indeed. Um, and and I'll, I'll ask Arsel to, to uh, follow Laszlo's podcast, but also come and take my class because I know Arsel. <laughs> there you go. And, uh, and we can talk about the Japanese occupation of Taiwan from 1895 to 1945, and then the Civil War and this, this rich, um, rich history that, that Laszlo refers to. Lee and Rob, any, any final thoughts? And if you wanted to jump in on this, on this um, very uncontroversial topic, you can feel free. <laughs> real, two real quick comments. I'm gonna make one quick one about the Taiwan thing. You can hear, uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but Lee and I have very different experiences with that because I lived in the mainland for 10 years. I lived in China for 10 years. You can occasionally hear me accidentally say something like, Taiwan Island or something like that. Like Lee and I have, have varying degrees of references that we either edit out or try to change. It's kind of funny. Um, but I also threw in there in our chat, uh, our, the email address for the podcast too, for anyone who has a lot of questions, Lee and I answer emails. We love emails, love emails. To be fair, Lee answers more than I do. Uh, but I, 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 do, <laughs> I do follow them and answer some of them. So 
uh, go ahead, Lee. But anyway, yeah, please, please contact us. Any, any, anything from a topic to just how do you get started doing this? Whatever. Like we, we, we love emails. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have, we've talked about uh, doing kind of going in a variety of different directions. Rob, you and I have talked about maybe like uh, soliciting uh, uh, people's ideas uh, the, the way Laszlo does for, for future topics. So if you have a topic you really want, yeah. more than happy to, to hear it. Uh, if you just want to sound off, we love that too. Yep. Thank you all so much. This has been, this has been terrific. We'll, we'll plan a new, uh, a, a, a Taiwan conversation. That'll be for an- I'll be out of town that weekend, I think. <laughs> We're out of yeah, time. Yeah, I'm, I'm in France. The time difference is not going to allow me to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but thanks, Arsene. Thanks, thanks to, to Laszlo Montgomery, Robert Moore, Lee Moore of the China History Podcast and the Chinese Literature Podcast. I've shared their links there in the chat. I hope you guys will go check them out. I hope you'll click through. Um, I hope you will reach out uh, to these guys because indeed they do answer their emails. So if you want to hear uh, from them on a topic, please do. Uh, please do so. And, and, and be looking for the- Professor Jeremy Murray on a future uh, uh, yeah. China history podcast topic coming up uh, hopefully before Christmas. So uh, yes, oh. thank you for lighting the fires. <laughs> uh, we are we are going to get our Hainan uh, podcast uh, ah. off the ground. Nice. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and get that, get that running. That's in the works. Thanks, Laszlo. Um, I'm excited about that. It's been an honor. It's been a delight talking with you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who dialed in and, uh, and, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Bye everybody. Peace. And Thank love. you so much. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much.